Welcome to the city. I'm Anthony Wilson, Public Information Officer for the City of San Angelo. And joining us today is our new Fire Marshal, Ross Coleman. Ross, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. As I mentioned, you're new to our community, so why don't you introduce yourself and share a little bit of your background. Okay, I uh, was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. I uh, went to college at Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos and uh, began my began my career uh, with the fire department outside of the city of San Antonio in Universal City. Uh, ended up uh, finishing up college and started working for the state fire marshal's office. I was a field deputy in Midland, Texas. That's how I came to know West Texas. And I had about 83 counties assigned to me. I worked my way up to being a chief inspector and then eventually I, I finished there as the assistant state fire marshal over uh, fire prevention services and, uh, and inspection services. Uh, after that, I went and became the uh, Bear County Fire Marshal and uh, had a lot of responsibility there. We had uh, approximately 30 employees, uh, 1,100 CERT volunteers. I was also the emergency management coordinator. We had four hazmat teams. And uh, so I served my time there, uh, you know, very well. It was a great experience and we decided we wanted to come back to West Texas to raise our kids. So we have four children. So we, uh, we came back uh, here to San Angelo last November and uh, we're hopefully here to stay and you know enjoy ourselves and you know watch your kids grow up. So. Very good. Now tell us what the fire marshal's office does and what you're responsible for. Well here in San Angelo we, uh, we engage in many things. Uh, the most important thing that we do are our inspection services. Uh, inspecting our buildings, making our buildings fire safe for our community. We also uh, engage in uh, arson investigations, fire, fire arson investigations to look for origin and cause and at, at times, unfortunately, take people to, to jail for those offenses. But the most important thing we do is our fire prevention education. Uh, so we engage in many efforts for children, for adults, and we work on education programs to help people understand uh, why violations exist and what they can do to make their homes and their businesses fire safe. Well, it's one of the reasons that we're here talking today is uh, Fire Prevention Week is October 7th through the 13th. And you've mentioned to me that education is perhaps the main means of uh, fire prevention. What did you mean by that? Well, um, to us, uh, across the state of Texas and across the nation, most fire marshal's office, offices engage in uh, regulating fireworks, uh, regulating fire alarms and the inspection of them, the uh, sprinkler systems, fire extinguishers, and we do all these investigations, but we really don't spend enough time as a whole educating the public and sometimes when the fire marshal comes into your business or, or your home and and wants to look around and gives you things we're we're really weak as a whole at educating and trying to get people to understand why something's a problem and that that fundamental thing is really in our minds the most effective method of fire protection so we can go out and we can regulate things we can tell you uh, all this stuff all day about your business and we can write all these violations down but if we're not really clearly providing you an explanation and you don't understand uh, it's a hard it's a hard time to get that enforced and it's a hard time to get those things corrected and then we have buildings out there lingering with their violations so what are some of the ways that you seek to educate the public well um, Though the National Fire Protection Association's theme this year is, uh, you know, be rabbit ready. Rabbit ready meaning having two ways out, being able to escape. Um, I always have felt that our primary target audience is really not the kids or our elderly. It's everybody in between. It's the most majority of our lifespan. We have working professionals. Uh, you know, from PIOs and uh, fire marshals and attorneys and doctors, but we don't spend a lot of time doing fire prevention education. So I've, I embark on a program that I have that I've adopted from the state fire marshal's office called Have an Exit Strategy, where we remind Texans about the, the importance of getting out of the home. So I like to concentrate on adult fire prevention education because we're the decision makers and we make up the largest portion of the population. So um, I've uh, recently here at the city started a program where we're educating our own employees uh, about the dangers of fire and what to get out and, and how to handle that should we have a fire in one of our city owned buildings. So uh, we're, we're engaging that program and once we're done with all of our city buildings we're going to in, engage in doing fire drills so that we as a city can be accountable and we can practice what we preach. Well it's interesting uh, you mentioned about adults being your target audience. I hadn't really considered this but 
between grade school and the time you per may have to go to a nursing home, you really don't get much of that fire education, do you? No, you don't. In fact, you, most adults stop learning uh, fire drills and fire education when they leave high school. Uh, you may encounter that in college, you may not, but until you get into some sort of institutional setting where licensing requirements dictate that you have a fire drill, you're really not in tune with most of uh, most fire prevention models, you're not in tune, you, you tend to forget. We're, we're creatures of habit. So we get, we get locked into our daily routine and we forget about having windows that open out of every room. We forget that we're supposed to have a smoke detector in every sleeping room and in the proximity up. Yeah, we, we kind of think when the fire drill goes off in our buildings as working adults, well, it's a nuisance. It's somebody popping popcorn. And we really need to get out of that mindset and we need to leave every time. We need to exit every time. And when we do that, and we hold the people accountable that cause the, the nuisance alarms, then we're being safe, we're being smart, and nuisance alarms start going away. So it's really important that you know we as adults and the working group, we start taking us seriously and uh, listen to our fire prevention educators. So I, I really feel like you know, that, that, that's why I say you know, the most effective method of, of fire protection is prevention education. That is the way to do it. How often, how often should a home or a business conduct a fire drill? Well, <clears throat> most businesses uh, do them quarterly or monthly. Um, the more often you practice, obviously, the better you're going to be. There's information available on NFPA's website, which is www.nfpa.org, National Fire Protection Association, and they have a concept called EDITH, Exit Drills in the Home, and they give you ideas about how often you should do it. But really, if you have a large family like I do with children, you should be practicing fire drills often, maybe on a monthly basis, but you need to check your windows, your doors, you need to make sure that you also have a point of safety, a place to go to that only the people in the house know so that there's somewhere where everybody can be accounted for. So, um, you know, one thing that's also important to realize is though we inspect the businesses, uh, we generally have a fire in the state of Texas every seven seconds of some sort whether it's automobile, wild land, home, or business. So ac across the state of Texas, we have all this problem with, with these multiple fires, but guess which occupancy we don't inspect on a routine basis? The home. Guess where our fires are? Most of them are in the home. So the most important thing we can do as a homeowner is practice fire drills often. So if you have a lot of children and they're young, it's probably best to, to practice, those, practice those drills at least once a month. You talked about the theme for this year's Fire Prevention Week is rabbit ready, and that means having at least two exits uh, yes, out of the home. What are those exits? What do they typically consist of for, for most homes? Well, for most homes, it's a front door and a window leading out of a sleeping room. So anywhere in your home, you should always have two exits. So if you're in the general area of your house, not the sleeping rooms, you should have a front door and a back door. Once you enter your sleeping room, you should have the door that goes back into the hallway or your option of a door or window going directly to the outside. Now, uh, when we do inspections, we have to engage in a little education about that issue as well because some people don't seem to understand what a secondary exit really is. And that is a secondary door or window going directly to the outside. It's not a Jack and Jill bathroom. Uh, you, it's not uh, perceived to be a good exit to go through an intervening room or space to get to another door to get to the outside because most often those doors are going to go back in that same hallway where your primary door is and so you're still locked in. So we need to have a, a door or a window leading directly to the outside and that's what's deemed to be a safe and, and prudent manner for secondary egress. Daylight savings times ends at the end of October and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that generally a good time to check the batteries in your uh, smoke detectors? Yeah, that's a, that's a general uh, time frame that we like to advertise. It's a great reminder. But really, you want to check your detectors monthly, and you want to change your batteries at least twice a year if you, if you need to. Um, uh, I also advise many residents, if, if, if financial means are, are within your, uh, your, your scope, to uh, get hardwired smoke detectors that are interconnected and have a licensed electrician put in. And what those do is they act as a fire alarm system. So if you have, a, if you have smoke in one room and that one detector goes off, they all go off, alerting everybody in the house. And that way you have almost a general alarm in your home and they have battery powered backup. So if the power fails, the nine volt batteries kick in. Um, so uh, if, if, you're, if you have the means, it's highly, highly uh, important that you, you consider that and get an electrician to, to get that wired in for you. 
One of the initiatives that I know that you are interested in is Wildland Urban Interface. Explain what that is. Yeah, uh, in the uh, fire world we call it a WUI, Wildland Urban Interface. Um, but what's really important these days is, uh, as you saw with the past fires that we had, we had the Wildcat Fire here in San Angelo. We had the large fires in Bastrop. Uh, we had the fires around San Antonio and South Texas. And what you saw was uh, devastating losses. And what we learned is that we have come of the age now where the wildland fires that you've had over in the west are, are now affecting Texas. And with that, we have had an increased population in these areas. People are coming from other states and they're building out into the outskirts of San Antonio and in the outskirts of uh, Bastrop area outside of Austin. And they're putting homes part where we have dense wildland urban interface. And what's really important is to get on the websites and learn about that. How do you firescape your home? I know that with our water restrictions right now, we're talking about zero scaping and these types of things. <clears throat> but you can learn about firescaping your home, uh, not parking your car in the grass, uh, putting granite and crushed granite gravel and, and uh, low-lying shrubs and things that will not uh, allow fire to spread to your home, giving you a defensible space between your home and that wildland area that, that you have surrounding your home. Here in Tom Green County, we have houses out in those areas. Uh, and so it's really important that if, if you're living in one of those dense areas where you have a lot of mesquite and dense brush, uh, we've, under our drought conditions, that thick undergrowth will take off very quickly and time will be of the essence. So not only do you have that problem, but you also need to think about having two ways out of your neighborhood and two ways away from your house and your car. So. Uh, you know, it's something that I, I want to urge people to, to really look into, think about, get online, get on the U.S. Forest Service. They have a bunch of tips and, and helpful hints on how to firescape your home and how to prepare for that. So if you're particularly out in those outlying areas, it's a, it's a very important thing to do. And, and really when emergency management and firefighter services and police are telling you to leave, just like the surround and drown, no, it's, uh, uh, turn, around, don't turn around, don't drown, sorry. Uh, it's really important to listen to what they're telling you. If they're telling you to leave your home, get out of your home. You saw many people during the wildland season that would not leave. Um, we tell people all the time, you know, don't, don't drive a, across the, around the blockades and, and try to cross that flood, you're not gonna make it. Don't try to cross the tracks. Listen to what we're saying, it's important information and we're not just telling you this, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's important for your health. So. Uh, really encourage people to understand about wildland, urban interface, and, and all the other attributes in emergency management that could affect you. So the firescaping that uh, goes hand in hand with the wildland urban interface, does that same concept hold true for a, a subdivision? Does it, would that help you Abs uh, absolutely. in your neighborhood? <clears throat> absolutely. Um, you know, when you get closer to the downtown area here in San Angelo, for instance, uh, you don't have a large wildland interface, but it doesn't take long to go out uh, into certain areas in the outskirts of town and see brand new, uh, expensive, nice homes being built and people trying to improve uh, their way of life and having these nice areas. But you can see along the riverbanks and other areas where you know you have a, a thick brush, you have a lot of trees, you have a lot of growth, and it's dry. So wildland fires are not accidents, okay? With the exception of lightning, it's usually at the cause of a person, whether it's emitting sparks, whether it's uh, from welding, whether it's from discarding cigarettes. So it's very important that, that people, even in town, engage in, in effective uh, firescaping. One of the uh, functions of your office, as you mentioned earlier, is arson investigation. Talk a little bit about what an arson investigation typically entails. Well, we follow a guide from the National Fire Protection Association called the Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigations. It's nationally and actually uh, used worldwide. Um, it has criteria and it requires that we follow a scientific method when we conduct a fire investigation. A fire investigation in and of itself is the origin and cause of a fire. It's very difficult sometimes and it's very hard when your building's just a few feet off the ground at that point and the whole building is, uh, is damaged and there's a large uh, content loss. But through that methodology and to prove the scientific method, we have to rule things out and just as much as we rule things in. Well, typically on a large fire call in for a K accelerant K9 from the State Fire Marshal's Office, which is provided to us at, at no cost, so it's a, a great attribute, and, and they will come in and they'll look for accelerants. They have a, they've trained to send out uh, accelerants. 
And we'll take our samples and we'll take our notes and we'll examine a fire all day long to come up with a solid origin and cause. What makes something an arson investigation is the point at which our origin and cause evidence becomes uh, something uh, of culpability. Uh, we may also get witness statements and other things. So it's a, it's a criminal investigation, but there's a lot of science to it. And it's not a very glamorous thing. You'll, you'll usually see us uh, waist high in dirt and debris uh, digging with shovels because we have to pull everything out and examine all the items. Uh, the fire that we had recently had a large content loss and had a, a large amount of uh, of uh, antiques and, and other things. So there was a lot of storage in there. So it took us quite some time to the point that we had to get some dozers involved to pull material out. So not only can we examine that scene, but it is safe for us to do so. If we have a scene where we have a possible uh, roof collapse pending or something like that, we, we can't even do our origin and cause because it's not deemed safety for us. So we have to look out for ourselves first before we engage in that. So. Um, it's a very lengthy process, and uh, most often it's, it's, it's difficult to prove. But with the good evidence and following the scientific method, you, you take all that information, and then now it's required that you do peer review. So we get with a group of our peers. So I'll usually call up uh, colleagues in the office, uh, colleagues at county and state levels, and say, hey, I, this is what I've got. Uh, what do you think? You know, here's my pictures, here's my information, uh, here's how I came to this conclusion to see if they agree. Because if a case goes to court, they're going to ask us, did you do a peer review? What are, where are your peer review notes? What, what, what did the collaboration of everybody's efforts uh, conclude? Did they conclude that your findings were in fact, you know, an incendiary fire intentionally set? If a citizen has questions about any of these topics that we've discussed here today, how can they get in touch with your office? The best way is to call us directly. It's 325-657-4358. Um, you can ask for me directly. Uh, and uh, I try to return every phone call I get. So uh, ask to talk to a fire inspector or ask to talk to the fire marshal and what your issue is. If I'm on the phone, I'll usually call you right back. Very good. We've been talking with our fire marshal, Ross Coleman. After this message, we'll return with our budget manager, Morgan Trainer. My name is Salvador Sanchez. I'm a, a crew chief for the Parks Department. I've been working with the city for 25 years. I like what I do. I like the projects. I do something like this. I like the, the old parks, you know, landscape, you know, rock work, cement, and everything is what I do is different than anything else I've done before. We do remodel the parks. We do the playgrounds. We do it. We take everything out of the park. We put everything new in the park, from playground, landscaping, a lot of times we do electrical, plumbing, everything, you know, it's got to go into the park. And everything's got to do with landscaping, we do it. We did uh, Meadow Creek, and we finished it about a year ago. We did Producers, we did City Park, we did Kiss Kingdom, Martin Luther King, we did Glenmore Park, and Kirby. It's nice to see the people enjoy, enjoy the area. It's nice to see the kids enjoying the playground. And kind of we look back the way it was and the way it looks now. And we get a lot of enjoy, see the people enjoy the, what we do. Civil League, uh, the, around the water lilies. Mm -hmm. We did that a few years back. It was a lot of work, but uh, now it turned out to be one of the nicest parks in town. You know, you, uh, I like it when I see people come in from out of town and you can see in their face, they never see anything like it. They enjoy the area and we get a lot of good comments about the area. Well, uh, Ken Linden asked me a few years back about naming a flower after me and I didn't like the idea because I can't see a name Salvador be a flower. And I just kind of let it go. Well, here this year he come up to me and asked me again and I said, well, if you want to do that, name a flower after my daughter. And it's had this become, you know, and it took a place uh, September the 15th, I think. Yeah. And, and so her name is Brittany Sanchez, and she's got her own flower. It was a big honor for me and big honor for her, you know, to see the, some of my hard work. Now I can see good things happen now. I'm working on a landscape at the city hall. It's going to be a big job to do, hard work, and I think it's going to be one of the nicest jobs that we're going to do in the city of San Angelo. This is different. Everything is different every day. You always 
thinking about what are you going to do, how are you going to get this accomplished, and make sure that everybody, people from the city hall, citizens, everybody enjoy what we do. When I'm at work, I like to travel, I like to go places, I like to see different things, and from where these places that we go, we see, I see a lot of uh, different things that I can do in the parts department. I get ideas from the, from the parts department. And uh, here, last month, I went to New York City, and I went to Central Park. You know, I always heard about Central Park. I want to see it for myself, and I got to see it. And there's some good ideas I might be able to make it work the hands and angel. In my 25 years, I've been with the parts department. And it's been the best place, the best thing that ever happened to me, working in the parts department. Well, even when I'm not at work, you know, when I, I, I go to different places, I find myself thinking about what I gotta do, what are, how can we get this job done, you know, on time, or, or how can we do a better job than what we're doing right now. That's what, and so really when I'm off, you know, I'm still thinking about work yeah. every day. Every day is good work, because you know, I enjoy every day because what I do, I enjoy this challenge that they put in front of me to, to get it done, and I enjoy it. Welcome back to the city. We are now joined by our budget manager, Morgan Trainer. Morgan, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, absolutely. This is a, a big day for you. It's the uh, first day of the uh, new fiscal year as we are sitting here talking. Uh, and of course, a lot of the talk with the fiscal year and the budget always revolves around the general fund. Tell us a little bit about what the general fund is. Sure, the general fund is um, the largest fund in the city. Of course, in government accounting, you have multiple funds so that you can keep all restricted monies to be spent on what they were intended for. So when we levy a property tax for police and fire, we keep it in the general fund because that's where we pay police and fire. So um, most of the discussion revolves around general fund. It's often um, the most um, able to change fund with the most uh, variables in it. And so that's why most of our city council discussions throughout the budget process revolve around the general fund. We'll talk a little bit about how big our general fund is and how it's funded. Sure. Our general fund is just over $58 million. It's $54.5 million in operating expenditures, and the remainder is transfers out to other programs, like uh, some grants require a local match, and so that's the remainder of that. So about $58 million in expenditures. Uh, the large part of that is... Um, police and fire, also street and bridge, um, the municipal court, uh, legal department. Uh, uh, most of your uh, departments that you think of when you think of local government exist in the general fund. And it's funded? Through um, property tax and sales tax primarily. So uh, property tax is the largest way to fund the, uh, the general fund and, um, and it's, we talk about it a lot. And so that's why it gets a lot of the attention is because people are interested in how their property and sales taxes are spent. Correct, and we're very interested in uh, levying taxes only to the extent we need them to run city services. Now the forecast this year for property and sales taxes was very, very good, correct? It was good, yes. We had um, about a million dollars extra, about $900,000 increase in um, property tax estimates, largely due to new property coming on the tax roll. So since we um, had in, uh, an increase in our property tax budget, we wanted to give that back to the citizens in a property tax rate reduction. And then the sales tax was up about a million and a half dollars. So that means that the economy is strengthening, uh, we're having more consumer confidence, and uh, more sales being transacted in San Angelo. So with those two taxes being up, and that's principally how our government, uh, city government is funded, you would expect that this would have been a very easy budget year, but our council wanted to put some priorities uh, and some emphasis on some different areas that forced some really difficult decisions. Talk a little bit about that. Sure, when we talk about two and a half million dollars increase in the general fund um, revenue, the, um, that sounds like a lot of money. But, uh, for example, municipal court revenue was down almost half a million dollars. And when you talk about building streets and funding um, police and fire raises, two, uh, $2 million doesn't go very far. So it's a lot of money to you and me, but it's not a lot of money when you're running this giant organization. And so um, 
we used to always, uh, something we always say in the office is, it's easy budget year when you don't have any money, because then you can't do anything, unfortunately. It's an easy budget year when you have a lot of money, because then you can fund a lot of things. But when you have a little bit of money, like $2 million, uh, can be a little bit of money when we're talking about streets. Um, it, it's a difficult budget year, and so lots of us have uh, different priorities, uh, different recommendations on what programs should be funded, and so that's why we had a lot of discussion this year with the City Council. And one of the things that was driving that discussion was the Council was really interested in investing a lot more in our streets, right? Absolutely, and it's something staff has, has recommended, and um, City Council absolutely agreed with us. And talk a little bit about, I know last year, or this current fiscal year, we spent $600,000 on street maintenance, and that increased to? About um, $1.6 million, so not quite triple the budget, but um, we absolutely need, need to reinvest in uh, maintenance of our streets. Uh, we have many streets on our engineers list uh, that are past their useful life that need to be reconstructed, and had they been maintained properly every year, they um, would not be on that list, perhaps. So we've got to increase our street maintenance. We've also got to increase our street reconstruction. So in the end, there ended up being a, a budget gap between the amount of money that we had available and what it was exactly that we wanted to do. That budget gap was addressed through a mixture of uh, budget cuts, expense cuts, and some uh, increases in fees. First, talk a little bit about the uh, budget cuts. Where did those come from and how much did they amount to? The budget cuts were about $900,000. You know, we had proposed a budget um, using all that excess revenue and um, additional revenue that was coming in. Um, we wanted to slot that into different programs. What we wound up doing was um, cutting some services. For example, the rec centers now will not open till 3 p.m. They used to open at 1 p.m. So that saved us a little bit of money. Uh, we had some reorganizations in the um, traffic department and street and bridge department, and so that yielded some savings. Um, the departments had submitted expanded level requests, which is our term for they need more money to maintain current operations. And so we had to cut that by almost $400,000. Um, and, and those are things div divisions needed uh, for continuing education, uh, utilities, things like that. So um, a lot of things added up to be cut from the budget finally to, to, to meet the city council's uh, direction. And one of the ways that was done was uh, we actually eliminated eight full-time positions, uh, mainly through attrition, correct? Mainly, yes. Um, the, the police department had two positions that were reduced. The nursing division had uh, a couple positions that were reduced as a part of this year's budget. So it was a combination of cutting staff and cutting services. But we believe that the services that were cut will not have a large impact on the citizens. And when you talk about cutting staff, uh, is it correct to assume that payroll uh, is the major expense of city government? Absolutely. Of the general fund, over 75% of the general fund expense is um, personnel. And so we can't maintain the streets, we can't um, run a city manager's office or anything without people. And so it, the people are the lifeblood of, of this organization and, and we can't do much without people. And so the only way if you're looking to cut expenses to do that in a significant way is to reduce your number of employees. Correct, absolutely. Now the other half of the equation were, were fee increases. Talk a little bit about what was done with fee increases. Sure, um, it, it's appropriate to look at um, user fees. Um, you know, the, the general population, population that pays for um, property tax shouldn't um, per se subsidize running a municipal pool, for example. And so we want to charge appropriate fees at the pool to, to cover our operating expenses at the, the new pool. So um, it's appropriate to every year, every couple years, review um, all the user fees. And so we had done that. We had discussed with divisions uh, what fees they charged and what needed to, to be adjusted. And so what we uh, wound up pr proposing to the city council was over $250,000 in increased user fees. This will be things like um, code compliance abatements. For example, if, if, if my neighbor doesn't mow his yard and code compliance has to come out and mow their yard, my property tax dollars shouldn't have to subsidize that, that act. So there's a, there was a punitive fee proposed for, for those types of incidences. Also, for example, planning fees. Um, developers in town, um, when they come in and apply for, for platting and things like that, your average citizen um, shouldn't bear the burden of that. Um, so we had some fees proposed. Uh, the city council has um, tentatively approved them. We, we talked with them in, in, in budget work sessions. They um, 
in, in theory approved them, uh, but we're going to wait to actually ratify them and put them into effect until the new city manager, Daniel Valenzuela, can, can review them. And at this point, they're looking at instituting, if they do institute those fee increases, instituting most of them effective January 1, correct? That, that's our hope, yes. I see. Um, what happened with the San Angeles property tax rate this year? The tax rate of that is the portion that the city levies was 78.6 cents per hundred dollars evaluation. Uh, we, um, since we were able to bring more property on the tax roll and explore other opportunities for um, revenue, uh, we recommended and adopted uh, reducing that tax rate. So the tax rate went from 78.6 to 78.1. That's a half a cent uh, reduction in the property tax. It's also important to note that your city portion that's charged on your property tax, um, we still offer the homestead exemption and all exemptions we always have. And so it, it's our goal to, to get that property tax rate down to, to a, an appropriate level. Well, a, a lot of people like to make hay over the fact that San Angelo does have a higher property tax rate but when you actually calculate the numbers, the average levy that a homeowner pays is less than what they might pay in Midland, Odessa, or Abilene. Why is that? Sure. When we look at our comparable cities, um, we did an, a, an evaluation this year and presented it to the city council about if we had the diverse um, property tax um, that, that other communities have. Um, I liken it to, for example, if you have an investment portfolio and you only invest in technology. Well, San Angelo, we have an investment portfolio in our property, and we only invest in residential. We don't have a whole lot of commercial. We don't have a whole lot of industrial. It's, it's primarily residential. And so while we, we love this community and we love the people that, that live here and lots of people retire here, uh, we need to invest in industry and we need to, to grow our, our tax base to include more industry. And that will help take the burden off the taxpayers, absolutely. And it's also fair to note, as you mentioned earlier, we offer homestead exemptions that other communities do not, and their property values are generally higher than ours. Also. Yeah, yeah, we do. We offer a better homestead exemption. I would call it better. Um, a greater homestead exemption. Um, other cities offer a lesser homestead exemption or no homestead exemption at all. So if you lived in Abilene, Midland, or Odessa, um, your rate may be lower, but you're probably paying more in taxes. You mentioned about the general fund being the fund that we most often focus on in city government, but what are some of the other funds that comprise the city's budget? Sure, we talk about the other major funds, uh, Water Fund, of course, it's, it's a very hot topic right now, Wastewater Fund, which is similar, um, the Civic Events Fund, which is where we run um, the Convention Center Coliseum, those types of things, the Airport Fund is another, another major fund, a, a multi-million dollar fund, and the Development Corporation, which is where the, the sales tax, the half cent on the sales tax goes. So it's important to keep all those funds uh, separate, so that the reason, so for example, when you fly at the airport, the money you invest in the airport stays at the airport. And so that's the intent behind fund accounting. And when you add all those funds up together, what's the sum total of the city's budget? Our total budget, all funds, is about $134 million. So it, it's, it's quite a large budget. If citizens want to go about reviewing our budget, how do they do that? Absolutely. We, we strive for transparency and it's, it's our middle name. And so um, the budget is available at sanangelotexas.us. Just click departments and finance and um, we have archived year's budgets on there and the current year's. Our budget office is typically recognized by state and professional organizations. Talk a little bit about uh, those recognitions and what they mean for your office. Sure. Um, like I said, transparency is really big for us. We want people to understand the budget. We want people to have access to the budget. So the two um, major awards that we receive throughout the year that have, we've been lucky, lucky enough to receive in past years is um, the state comptroller gives a Texas Leadership Circle Award and it, we receive the silver award for transparency. And so we're really proud of that. Uh, we also receive the um, government finance officers um, distinguished budget presentation. So again, that's saying that our budget document that we prepare is um, transparent and um, speaks to about a lot of criteria that our professional organization requires. The budget year begins October 1, which is the day that we're filming this. When does the work on the budget begin? End of March, beginning of April. And so it takes a good six months to, to prepare a good budget, to vet everything out that, that needs clarification and, and get it adopted and get it um, open to the divisions to start operating. So now that the budget has been approved and this is the beginning of the fiscal year, what becomes the focus of the budget office? You, you obviously refocus from preparing the budget to? 
Well, first we need to make sure that all the items that City Council approved actually get implemented. So for example, one of the ways that the City Council voted to, to relieve the general fund was a, a new exploration of how to divvy up the hot allocation, the hotel occupancy tax. So we'll work with the, um, the relevant people to make sure that new hot ordinances get put in place, to make sure that everything we adopted in the budget um, actually gets executed. So that way the budget is achievable. Uh, we'll also start working on capital planning it takes us several months to uh, to prepare our five-year CIP capital improvement plan and so we're, we're already starting work on that and we hope to um, get that on the City Council discussion in November so we're right back to it and there's probably a misperception that budgets are carved in stone when in actuality they're very fluid documents aren't they absolutely the, the state law allows us to amend the budget for any reason a local government should need it so that, that's vague enough to that anything that comes up throughout the year, uh, we, there are different levels of approval. But for example, if, um, if you applied for a grant tomorrow and you just received the grant, well, we didn't know about that back in April when we were preparing the budget. So we'll take that back to the city council. We'll amend the budget ordinance. And so that takes two readings and um, we do that throughout the year. And if people want more information about our budget, again, how can they find the budget online? Sure, you go to sanangelotexas.us, click departments and click finance. We've been talking with Morgan Trainer. She is the budget manager for the city of San Angelo. We hope you'll join us for the next episode of The City.